struggled with the title for this message. The title is, Am I Really Okay? And um, I think most people wonder about that. Am I really okay? I remember when I was in high school, a couple years ago, how many of you remember a book that came out called, I'm Okay, You're Okay? Remember that book? Just saying you're okay doesn't make it so, does it? I remember I, I was doing a mural on a, class, on a sociology, social studies, sociology classroom wall while the teacher was teaching on that book. And he finally looked at me and he said, Underwood, what do you think? I told him. I said, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think we're okay. Um, I don't think anybody else did either. So let's open in prayer and we'll get started. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to preach your word. I pray that um, you'd just bless this message. Hide me behind the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. So I struggle every day with this person in my life who is my biggest problem. That person drives me crazy. They nag me. They trip me up. They belittle me. They pester me. They discourage me every chance I get. They tear me down. Guess who that person is? That person is me. I am not alone with this struggle. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Timothy that he is the chief of sinners. 1 Timothy 1.15, I am the chief of sinners. You know who his number one problem is? Himself. He struggles with that. And in Romans 7.24, that struggle, he says, it makes me wretched. Um... Wretched is not a good word. It comes from the Greek word tale pauros, and we used to make jokes about that in Bible school. We'd go, tale pauros. You know, just make a joke out of it, because we were so wretched. Um, not a joke, though. David, in the Psalms, all through the book of Psalms, is overwhelmed with his sinfulness. This is David, the king, the man after God's own heart. Psalm 38, 4, he says, my iniquities are a burden too heavy for me to carry. Psalm 41.12, he says his iniquities are more than the hairs on his head. That's a lot of iniquity. Um, Psalm 65.3, he says his iniquities prevail against him. You know what that word prevail means? He's constantly being tripped up by his sins. I relate to that. I want to warn you, this message may seem like a downer to you, and it shouldn't. Because the Apostle Paul did not live defeated or depressed or discouraged because of his sin. Because Romans 7.25, he said, I thank God through my Lord Jesus Christ. The struggle did not stop him. That's just huge. It did not destroy him. He wasn't depressed over it. Because every time he mentioned the struggle, he always follows it up with Jesus Christ and grace. Every time. But you've got to understand, there's this constant tension. That which I would, I would not. And that is, I mean, he's constantly, like he's balancing these two things all the time. John Newton wrote the song Amazing Grace. Out of his awareness of his own sinfulness, someone says he's talking about his past. He was not talking about his past. He said, amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. That's present tense. He wrote an a article called The Benefit of Remaining Sin. And he talks about the whole article that John Newton wrote. He talks about the struggle of the fact that I still sin all the time. Think about this. You've gotten saved. God has delivered you. And you pay him back by sinning. 
And guess what he offers you more of? More grace. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. Let me ask, let me say this. David didn't let his struggle cripple him either. Because David is called what? The sweet psalmist of Israel. He sang praises to God despite the ongoing struggle. I want to add something else here. If you don't get this about yourself and your sin, nobody will ever call you the sweetest anything of anywhere. You understand that? The awareness of your sinfulness and the constant reception of grace will change you into somebody sweet. It'll soften you. It'll soften you. So here's my biggest question. And this question drives me crazy. How can people who know the Bible, who know Jesus Christ, not feel the burden of this ongoing struggle with sin? In other words, how is it possible that I taught an adult Sunday school class in a church where there were older people who were in, in, in the holiness background church, which means sinlessness in their beliefs. And older people would look at me and tell me, I don't struggle with sin. I taught that class for four or five years, and finally the man that told me that I had a problem because I did, and I, 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 I've got a problem. The man finally came to me and said, you know, I, he, finally, he said to me, I want you to know, I realize I'm not perfect. And then, by the way, I like the guy. I, wasn't, I have no issue. I, I love the man. He's gone home now. How is it possible that you don't feel this burden if you don't feel this burden? Jesus speaking to the Pharisees when they didn't see their sin. This is people who had gone to church, the right church, with the right Bible, with the right theology. They believed in the resurrection. They weren't the Sadducees who didn't. They had everything right. And he said to them, you're blind because they couldn't see their sin. John 9.41. Um, and it offended them. He said, if you were blind, you should have no sin. In other words, God doesn't hold people accountable for that which they really have no ability to deal with. Amen? That's a big statement. Then he said, but now you say we see, we've got the light, therefore your sin still remains. That's a big statement. Truly saved people, people who know God intimately, Struggle with awareness of their own sins. Yes, they do. In fact, to me, if you don't have one of the very real signs that you are right with God, is that you have the struggle. Someone says, what do you mean by that, Pastor? Do you realize an unsaved person really doesn't care? Why would they? They might not like a certain sin, but they don't care that they struggle with selfishness and pride and, you know. The struggle with sin is an evidence that you've got a relationship with God, one that's growing. See, those people who struggle with sin will actually say with the Apostle Paul, I am, present tense, the chief of sinners. And by the way, we'll talk about this in a few more minutes, but he wasn't just blowing steam. I have come up with four possible reasons why people might not be able to say that they struggle with sin or might not even be able to admit to themselves that they struggle with sin. There may be more reasons, and for many people, these reasons, maybe all of the reasons apply, right? I mean... People aren't as simple as one ex explanation of the struggle. These four reasons, I think, are probably the four main ones, but maybe there's more. So number one, some people are so wounded 
by life in sin that they can't see beyond their pain. In other words, because they're hurting so bad, they can't see their sin. They've been walking down the middle of the road, which they shouldn't be doing, right? And they get hit by a car, and all they know is it hurts. And you don't preach to them while they're lying on the side of the road, and you don't say, you know, you shouldn't have been walking down the middle of the road. That's the wrong message to those people. I believe, by the way, that a lot of what we call evangelism does that. It breaks my heart. It takes grace of God poured out with compassion from a humble servant for that person to be able to hear anything. Sometimes it just hurts too much. And I look around the church and I see people who are too quick to preach and too slow to comfort and show compassion. Amen? So number two reason. By the way, i got to say this about that reason. They're hurting and who's the great physician? Right? Who is the one that can heal and help? It's Jesus Christ. Because he's a great physician. Number two reason makes me really sad. It really does. It breaks my heart. Jesus said in John 8, 12, and 9, 5, I am the light of the world. And I'm going to take a moment to see if I can explain this to you. But light does what? It reveals things, does it not? It shows up the dirt. We think of light as the visible spectrum of the rainbow, right? I mean, because our eyes do not see all forms of light. I don't know if you know that. We see a limited spectrum of the, of the rainbow. But there's x-rays and ultraviolet rays, and I read about some new ones in the, about a month ago that I had no idea were out there. Um, some kind of particle, not particle, weird thing that they were talking about. Some lights are so bright, according to 1 Corinthians 4, 5, that they reveal the hidden things of darkness. Um, which it says in 1 Corinthians 4, 5, until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels, the thoughts of the hearts. So you get these really bright lights. And um, I used to be a contractor, painter. And I thought I was a pretty good painter. Until I'd get my spotlights up and I'd paint the room and it looked nice with my lights until I encountered a painter that used a 1,500-watt spotlight. And they could put... You know what happens when you dim the lights in here? The walls look pretty good. But you brighten those lights up and suddenly you see where there's paint needed. The dirt spots, the splotches, the brighter the light, the more the dirt gets revealed. Jesus is the light of the world. If you get close to him, guess what you're going to see? The closer you get, the more dirt you see. The Apostle Paul, when he said, I am the chief of sinners, probably was closer than anybody else ever got. So he saw more dirt. The more dirt you see, the more you're accountable for. The more you see your failures. Now you feel like the chief of sinners. The prime example of someone who shouldn't have, should have known better. How many of you ever had someone say, you should have known better? <laughs> I hate that one. Well, he should know better. And yet Romans 7 still exists. He should know better. Do you know that if the light is bright enough, this is something I hope I never see, because it will probably be the last thing I see, 
but if the light is bright enough, it will make a solid rock translucent. I don't know if you knew that. That's the last thing that happens before the rock burns up, too. You can see through brick walls when uh, the light is that bright. But we don't live through it either. That's why God is called a consuming fire because he is the brightest light there is. John the Baptist said this about it. I must decrease. The closer I get to Jesus, the less I am and the more he is. And you know what happens? It's not, that a, it's, it's not a bad thing. Because guess what? The light is the one that makes me full of joy and peace and gladness. He shows me, the closer I get to the light, not only do I see more dirt, but I see more grace, and more mercy, more forgiveness, more love. And I quit thinking things like, he's probably not loving me anymore. You ever struggle with that one? The closer you get to the light, the more you want him. That's the truth. If you're really getting close to Jesus Christ, the more you want of him. More relationship, not religion. David says in Psalm 27, 4, one thing I desired of the Lord, that I might behold his face. That's the David that struggles with sin. I want to see the one who loves me. Amen. Amen. The next reason for not seeing your own sin is really sad. This happens to people who don't get close to the light. They have The Pharisees are the perfect example of this one. They go to church. They serve in the church. They work hard in the church. They work hard to do good things. And they measure everything by performance. By what you do. They call, by the way, the Bible calls that works. These people have replaced the true light with a false light called religion. That's why the Pharisees were blind, because they did all the things religion said and forgot relationship face to face with God. And it blinded them. And it happens to people who are saved. And, in fact, it can only happen to people who are saved. That one. They're so full of religion that they can't see their sin. I saw a forum discussion for pastors where they were actually asked the question, I couldn't believe it, would you allow people who struggle with a little bit, and then they named a certain sin, a little bit of sin in the church? What made me sad is some of the pastors said no. And some of them, like me, were super offended by the question. Well, who else are you going to let in? Right? That's right. I mean, this is not a place to keep... See, here's what happened. Religious people think they need to keep themselves in the church pure... Forgetting it's not about them keeping it pure, but about bringing sinners to the Savior, to the person of Jesus Christ. And you know what happens with these religious people? They are self-righteous. They're full of good works. They're full of good behavior. They actually have a little light. It's called a false light. It's a little bit of light. A little bit. Isaiah chapter 50 puts it this way. Those that trust God walk in darkness. Because <laughs> the only way you get close to God is how? 
by trust. They trust God, they walk in darkness, and they see everything through somebody else's eyes. Whose eyes do they see it through? God's eyes. They see things how God sees them, therefore they're not blind. Then it says, those who trust in their own works, they manufacture, and the Bible actually says this in Isaiah 50, 10, 11, they manufacture sparks. Do you know that sparks have light? And as he, God says to them, I will give you this, you can walk in the light of your sparks. I'll give it to you. That's not really a good thing because it says, but you will lie down in sorrow. Now here's what I want to say about that. I don't know anybody who walks by their efforts in religion who doesn't have a life full of sorrow. I mean, last week, we listened to Heather talk about her walk and how hard it was. And yet she was full of joy because she trusted God, not her works. Full of joy. And here's what happens. The light of religion is always works. It's not trust. The light of religion is always works. The false light is almost impossible to penetrate with grace. Jesus comes up to the Pharisees and they go, No, no light. They couldn't even see who he was. And then you get someone like Nicodemus who saw who he was, he said, I know your teacher from God, come from God. He knew who Jesus was. And because of his religion, he still couldn't openly embrace Jesus Christ. Right? Because his religion blinded and crippled him. On top of that, Jesus could do no mighty work in Nazareth. Why? Because of their unbelief. You know, I used to read that thinking, these people must have been awful drunkards and alcoholics and adulterers. And I mean, no, because they didn't believe. They were probably very religious. And then Jesus in Mark chapter 3, verse 5, is grieved at the Pharisees because of the hardness of their heart when he made somebody whole on the Sabbath day. You know what they said? You didn't do it right. Yeah, we see somebody healed, but you didn't do it right. (coughs) That is what happens with religion. I almost always when I hear somebody say that in the church, you didn't do it right, and they ignore what God just did, I always know there's a problem with some religion going on. Religious people, saved or lost, see themselves as righteous because of their good works. Now the fourth reason. This one is scary. Oh, all right. Not jumping. There we go. This is the fourth reason. Romans chapter 1 says, when they knew God, they worshipped him not as God, neither were they thankful. That's a sad verse. What happens here is people who know God decide to worship the creation more than the creator. If you read the passage, you'll get that. They decide to worship stuff. They like this world more than they like God. It doesn't say they don't believe in God. But this is Romans 121 through 32. And they, so they, they choose to worship stuff. And you say, what do you mean by worship? They just love it more than they love God. That's all it means. And it says three times, because people did this, God gave them up to deeper darkness. In other words, they said no to God, and God said, okay, you can have what you want, but it's going to cost you. 
I call that judicial hardening of the heart by God. He had made a determination that people are going to have a harder heart because of their choices they've already made. And eventually they get to the place where they embrace all kinds of evil. And it says, and they take pleasure in those that do those things. They end up completely blind. And they excuse all kinds of sin. Actually take pleasure in it. And Hebrews 12.10 says this, A Christian can fail the grace of God and become bitter. By not, just by saying no to God and his discipline. And so people become blind to their own sin for one of four reasons according to this message. Number one, they just hurt so bad by life. And they need compassion. Number two, they don't get, they don't get close enough to the light of the world, that is to God, to see their own dirt. And I think that one where most of us live most of the time. Eventually, they replace the light of the relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, relationship is the key word. They replace the light of a close walk relationship with Jesus Christ with religion. Revelation chapter 3 says they left four, four. I get it right. Four says they left their first love. No, three, three, one. Church at Ephesus left its first love. That's what they did. They walked, they got away from relationship and became religious. And they, and God said, I know your works. They work hard. And that blinds them to their own sinfulness. And number four, God judicially hardens their heart because of their choices to worship the world more than God. So, David so much loves the light. This is, it's, I just love this. He so much loves the light that he is grieved by the distance between himself and God that his sin does. And instead of letting that distance get bigger, he says to God, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way, any way in me that keeps me away from you. And then lead me in the way everlasting. That is a walk with Jesus Christ. Closer and closer. So in closing, I want to tell a story. Short. Once upon a time, there was a group of people who struggled with alcohol. And they draw together in a meeting a group called AA. And a visitor walks in, believe it or not, and he looks at them and says, I know you guys, you're all a bunch of alcoholics. How rude. You know how they respond? Well, duh. Right? Now I'm going to change the story. Once upon a time, there was a group of people called sinners. And they met together in a place called a church. And someone walks into the church and says, I know you guys. You're a bunch of sinners. A, are they offended? Or B, do they say amen? Right? Right? So here's the closing question. What would church be like if we quit pretending? Amen? Do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Or are you pretending? Lord, I ask that you bless this message. Help each one of us to look at ourselves and nobody else this morning. And see if we're authentic in our faith. If we're walking with you in a relationship and heading that way more and more all the time. Or if we're pretending 
if we're full of religion or worse. Lord, help us deal with this. Every head bowed, nobody looking around. If God spoke to you, you say, Pastor, I just need you to pray for me about this. I, I don't know. Amen. I see hands. Amen. God is good. He's very merciful. No one looking around yet. If, if you want to talk about this more, I'm more than open to meet and talk to people. Lord, I pray you'd help us come closer to you. You are the light so worthy for us to come close to. Help us do it. Help us not be afraid of the light. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.